Uh, welcome to Alternative New York, or maybe given its alternative, we should be Alternative New York. And just give it a slightly different angle to everything. Uh, I'd like to thank our organizers, my old friends, Danny Fingeroth and Karen Green, and my new friend, Jeremy Dalber, for inviting me to be part of this and for putting together such a great collection of talent that we've got over here. Uh, as Karen said, I'm Gene Canterbury, Jr. My book, uh, 500 Essential Graphic Novels, came out in 2008, and that's a book that would look entirely different if I did it today. Uh, so much changes in four years. Uh, in a previous life, I was the chair of the International Comic Arts Festival and the comics and comic art area of the Popular Culture Association, and I've written essays about comics on topics from Windsor McKay to Charles Atlas parodies. Go Charles Atlas. Uh, I love the art form of comics, but I find the business or sort of the publishing and the reception of that art form all somewhat baffling. Our cartoonists on this panel, among them, publish in newspapers across the country and have entries in Bartlett's familiar quotations or take as their subjects classic works of literature, or just chronicle the many and varied aspects of everyday life. None of that actually seems alternative to me. Uh, alternative to what exactly? Uh, maybe our panelists can shed a little light on that. Uh, if I can just uh, introduce our panelists in alphabetical order, and they're luckily sitting in alphabetical order, starting from the right. We have Charles Brownstein, the executive director of the Comic Book Legal Defense Fund, which is a nonprofit organization that protects the medium's First Amendment rights by providing legal representation and education in matters affecting the rights of comic book creators, retailers, librarians, and readers. No small task there. In addition to his work at the CBLDF, he's written extensively about the medium with publications including the award-winning books Eisner Miller and The Oddly Compelling Art of Dennis Kitchen. Dennis was just here on the last panel. I first discovered uh, Charles through his magazine Feature way back in the day, which published some wonderful interviews with many cartoonists, and I've still got all those in a box somewhere, uh, which uh, th they're part of the permanent Cannonberg collection. Uh, seated next to him is Bill Griffith, a longtime underground cartoonist and the creator of Zippy the Pinhead Daily Comics. Uh, Zippy's been nationally syndicated since 1986 by the first and oldest American comic syndicate, King Features, which is still in New York City. And this, makes Mil this makes Bill perhaps the most mainstream of any of this weekend's guests, given the potential size and breadth of his readership. He's on the Alternative Comics panel. Excellent. I was lucky enough to see a gallery show of his original Zippy artwork in Hudson last year. I got to uh, enjoy great artwork and a free ding-dong. Uh, Fanagraphics has just published a collection of Griffith's early underground work, Bill Griffith, Lost and Found, Comics, 1969-2003. I first learned about Griffith when Zippy began being published in the pages of the Milwaukee Journal in the late 1980s. At first, I did not get it. <laughs> what is this? But somehow, suddenly, everything snapped, and I've been hooked ever since. I've tracked down all the books. Uh, Zippy Quarterly is everything, uh, and I even got to write about, the com write about him for the Comics Journal's Top 100 Comics of the 20th Century issue. And sorry it was only at number 69, I was not responsible for the numerical ranking of that one. Uh, Arsene Koryak, uh, Bob was born in the San Francisco Bay Area in 1982, and is the... No, no he was not! This... this, this <laughs> uh, Bob is the author of Masterpiece Comics, drawn in quarterly. <laughs> So close. <laughs> I'm off to a great start. His cartoons and illustrations have appeared in The Onion, The New Yorker, SpongeBob Comics, Mad, and many other publications. He's drawn for The Daily Show with Jon Stewart and Ugly Americans. Uh, Bob has taught illustration at Parsons, the New, York, the New School for Design, and comics at the Center for Cartoon Studies up in Wright River Junction, Vermont. Uh, since 1997, he's presented his cartoon slideshow series, Carousel, around the U.S. and Canada. My first introduction to his work was in Raw, Volume 2, uh, especially good old Gregor Brown, uh, his, uh, per his pitch perfect retelling of Kakova's Metamorphosis using the visual vernacular of Charles Schultz's Peanuts. Genius. Uh, Julia Wirtz was born in San Francisco Bay Area in 1982. <laughs> and is the author illustrator of the, as she puts it, unfortunately titled Fart Party, Volumes 1 and 2, and the Eisner-nominated graphic novel Drinking at the Movies. Uh, Fart Party is now known by the somewhat less evocative title Museum of Mistakes. Now, she's currently at work on a book for Kayama Press due out in September 2012, 
And she lives in Greenpoint in Brooklyn and probably has enough to her apartment in weeks. So we're very glad to see her here tonight. Uh, uh, I apologize, I was not really aware of Fart Party when it was an ongoing thing. Sadly, that's the trouble with the internet. There's so much out there. Uh, so I didn't actually learn about her work until the librarian where I work brought me an advanced reader's copy of Drinking at the Movies as a present from a conference she'd gone to. I was blown away by Julia's subtle but effective manipulations of the comics format and especially by her comic voice and timing, uh, which are just hilarious. Okay. Our brief this afternoon was to examine uh, both New York in underground and alternative comics and as a home for underground and alternative cartoonists. That's a lot to do in 50 minutes. Uh, but if, if I could just uh, start off with a kind of a general question for everybody on the panel, just uh, briefly. Uh, what to you makes something alternative? Uh, do you consider your art or theme somehow alternative? And if so, alternative to what? Uh, why don't we start with Charles, actually? <laughs> the only one here that doesn't make comics. <laughs> uh, but, I, but I've, you know, spent a lot of my career uh, writing about and, um, and, and defending a variety of comics. And the thing that I think binds the individuals on this panel together and creates this um, sensibility of alternative or what began as underground is a dedication to the authorial impulse in the work. And so I believe that if you look at comics in the late 1960s and early 1970s when the underground moment occurred, comics were thought of as these children's creations, these you know, characters, the superheroes. They weren't really thought of for their authors outside of very rare examples of the, the men in the strip papers. And so I think alternative tends to historically mean that these are people that are authors first and pursuing their authorial vision um, through art. And I think today when you see a creator like Julia or a creator like Bob working in, um, in the medium, they're an al alternative to the more corporatized structure of media. You know, Bob is commenting whimsically on trademark and ownership of, cult of culture when he's juxtaposing classic characters with classic art styles that actually belong to corporations. And so in that regard, I think he's providing an alternative to that ownership. I think Julia is an interesting full circle because back in the day when guys like Bill were creating underground comics and you know, lashing out at the system, the system was appalled and they started prosecuting you know, the retailers. Now they're trying to buy her and take her out to Hollywood. <laughs> and, you know, to that degree, I think, you know, it, it stands that the binding influence is, you know, this independence of, of authorial vision that, you know, ties the generations together and makes these things alternative. Yeah. Uh, Bill? Well, Charles, just all, all my best lines. <laughs> I was going to say, when I did underground comics, you could get busted for it. You'd actually get arrested. Not the cartoonists, but the, the distributors, the, the bookstore clerks. As a matter of fact, in 1973 and four, there was a Supreme Court ruling on pornography that said that pornography was something that would be determined by community standards, which was then a, uh, uh, taken up as a sort of a banner by, by crusading DAs trying to get reelected, and they, would, they busted underground comics coast to coast, and suddenly they were all coming back from the from the stores, and the people that got busted were the clerks behind the counter. Um, we, as cartoonists, were untouched, but kind of chilled by the whole thing. And the publishers went through a, uh, a real uh, crisis. The whole thing almost kind of went belly up. I remember in about 74, I started working with Art Spiegelman doing wacky packages, and I thought this was gonna be my new career, that the underground comics thing might be over. But it bounced back and uh, managed to survive. I, I think San Francisco Underground Comics, I kind of put at um, uh, a period of like 1967 to about 1982, something like that, when I consider it to be truly underground. After that, there was another generation that came along, people like Dan Klaus and Chris Ware. And I think, you know, to the degree that we paved the way for them, they, they carried the whole thing on. And little by little, uh, gained even a larger audience, and I'm very grateful for that because I rode as they rode my coattails, I rode theirs. <laughs> um, and there, there are, there's always been waves of interest. To me, alternative at the time that, that we didn't use that word, we used underground. Um, what that meant to me was 
all the comics I, I didn't really like. Uh, <laughs> we were not them. Um, <laughs> if, I remember we once had a meeting in my house. I think we were trying to organize a union, some crazy plan. And uh, Ted Richards, who you may or may not know the name Ted Richards, he did a comic book called Dope and Dan. He was one of the air pirates from the 70s. Um, he came to the meeting with the idea that we should get out of the underground and go mainstream and work for King Features. This was in like 1976, something like that. And we laughed him out of the room. <laughs> Ten years later, I was working for King Features. <laughs> so I've, I've gone all the way from under to above ground um, and somehow managed to, um, to still not bow to the corporate interests when I, um, when I started doing Zippy as a daily, first it was just in the San Francisco Examiner in 1985. Uh, and Will Hurst, who had kind of Will Hurst III, had inherited the paper from his uncle. Uh, the paper was failing, of course, that's why he got it. <laughs> and he decided to hire me, Crum, and Hunter Thompson. <laughs> I was the only one that worked out. Uh, Robert, his heart was not in it. Somewhere there's 20 or 30 strips that he and Aileen did together, full of sex and cursing, which they handed in <laughs> to Will. <laughs> um, and of course he said sorry. Uh, and that was the end of that. Hunter Thompson, I think, lasted maybe three, three or four columns. He went out in a blaze of gunfire, I remember. <laughs> um, and then a year later, King Feeders approached me. So when people ask me, how do you get syndicated? How do you do something as weird as get Zibby the Pinheaded into, into the Washington Post? I say you work in obscure underground publications for 15 years and then wait for the phone call. <laughs> and if you want to hear more stories like that, you need uh, uh, Bill's new book. His introduction is just nothing but stories like that over and over and <laughs> over. It's amazing. It's lots of fun. Uh, Bob. Well, again, a lot of great lines have been said already, but one thing that certainly occurs to me is that alternative art is generally the art that doesn't pay. And that is where <laughs> a lot of us live. But what is interesting, I graduated college in the late 80s and alternative rock was starting to happen and then suddenly alternative rock sort of became the mainstream and alternative bands like REM became the biggest band around and alternative bands like U2 won the alternative Grammy in like 1992. It's like they were already the biggest band and suddenly they were alternative. So these, these, these definitions of what's alternative and what's mainstream are very fluid. Um, but I do think the authorial voice is maybe a big part of what makes alternative comics different than mainstream comics, which are a small portion of the marketplace too at this point. So these lines are really blurry. I've certainly traveled from from making no comics to some publications to making uh, comics for mainstream publications like The New Yorker. I don't get those as much as the no paying jobs, but they exist, <laughs> they coexist. And somehow um, alternative is this very amorphous form that I think is great for marketing. But you, know, you make the work you wanna make and you let other people you know, pigeonhole you and hopefully that does you some good. <laughs> Um, yeah, I'm kind of uh, with you on this one. Like, alternative to my generation just sort of means, I, it's kind of a nice way, I guess, of saying that you do something that no one's really interested in. You're like, oh, they're not buying it because it's alternative. They don't understand. Um, or we use the word indie a lot in my generation of comics. And um, I mean, I don't, I don't know. I don't really bother myself with wondering, like, am I alternative or mainstream or indie? Because everyone just says, like, I'm an indie creator, and I've worked with mainstream publishers. Um, my book did not sell for them. So, you know, maybe it, it is something that should be corralled into a small sort of population of people doing something. Um, I don't, I think they pretty much said everything about it. <laughs> it just means you'll be poor for forever if you're <laughs> Oh, after, after this afternoon, big time. <laughs> big time <laughs> that means Everybody here is going to buy a copy of her book. Okay. Uh, let's see. I'd like to provide, uh, proceed in a kind of a chronological way at first, talking kind of about the venues 
uh, available to underground or alternative cartoonists uh, in New York from kind of like the late 60s until today. This will not be inclusive, but it's just uh, a few things to get through. And then uh, maybe even concurrently, there's going to be a little overlap probably. We can talk about New York as a home to alternative cartoonists and the communities and friendships that evolve from that. Uh, as somebody said earlier, there's probably more cartoonists on one block in, on one street in Brooklyn than there is in all of most other cities combined. Uh, and then uh, we can also talk a bit about our cartoonists, their own work that, was, that has been specifically inspired by New York. And then uh, after that, uh, Charles uh, is going to talk to us a bit about the ramifications of producing alternative work, and those ramifications for creators, publishers, booksellers, and sometimes even readers. Uh, and we'll start with Bill Griffith, who's, like I said, one of the pioneers of the underground comics. And Bill sent me several images of early New York-based undergrounds, and I was kind of hoping that you could talk a little bit about them and maybe how you got into comics with an X in the first place. Yeah, I, I started doing comics in late 1968 after having seen, um, I think it was Kim Deitch's work in the East Village Other. At first, I didn't really distinguish between Kim and Crumb, believe it or not. <laughs> I mean, I can't believe I thought that at one point, but to me it was just wild, underground, wacky stuff, and it was like saying things that I wish I had said and drawing things I wish I had drawn. I was not doing comics. I came to comics uh, circuitously. I loved comics as a kid, then I lost interest. As a teenager, I paid no attention whatsoever. And, but in, late, in the late 60s, uh, I had several friends who were into comics. In fact, I lived right around here, within 10 blocks of where we are right now. And they kind of reintroduced me to stuff. And Kim Deitch himself, I had gone to college with in, at Pratt in 1962 to 64. And he had introduced me to Windsor McCann, and Little, Little Nemo, and Crazy Cat. I had never heard of them. So that kind of little time bomb. <laughs> went off six years later in 1968. A friend of mine basically goaded me to doing a comic. And I was, it was a filthy, surreal piece of junk, but I <laughs> took it down to screw. I think it was screw number three. This was a sex tabloid that, at that point, I didn't realize. I just thought it was an underground paper. I didn't distinguish. <laughs> Once again, sex, drugs, it was all the same. So I, I brought my strip down to the offices of a screw, which was, uh, I think it was Al Goldstein's apartment on the Upper West Side somewhere. And Steve Heller, who later became the art director for the New York Times Book Review and a major book designer and major everything, um, <laughs> was the art director. And he took one look at my strip and he said, you drew it to the right proportions. <laughs> <laughs> You're the first one. <laughs> so it didn't really matter what it was. He just wanted to put it in because it was correct tabloid proportions. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so, but this, this cover here, this is, uh, this is the cover of Gothic Blimp Works number one. The Gothic Blimp Works was a comic tabloid spinoff of the East Village Other. And there were, the, these were the venues for comics when I was in New York in those couple of years. The East Village Other, <coughs> the Gothic Blimp, and Screw. Later, the New York Ace, but that was a couple of years later. This, I believe, Crumb did this cover for something else, and they just used it, because as you can see, it says Jive Comics. I think that was a cover for a comic he was, he was going to do that never actually happened. And this is number seven. This is Robert Williams, who one of the Zap artists, who is to this day a very successful painter in L.A. Um, the, the, uh, the East Village Other was... Um, you know, it was an alternative underground newspaper, but what, what made it commercially viable were the sex ads in the back, the classifieds. This was before the internet, you know, before internet porn. Um, <laughs> this, this was the reason these underground papers succeeded, because uh, uh, middle class white men bought them and took them home on the Long Island Railroad and did what they did with them. <laughs> and that was what made them work. The, the, the underground newspaper distribution was mafia controlled. They were happy about this. It all made sense to them. It, whenever anything, like when the Gothic Blimp came out, it, it only lasted eight issues because it had no sex ads. <laughs> it, had, it had just weird comics. The mafia <laughs> distributors were just puzzled and befuddled by this. And they gradually just pulled it off the stands. It probably sold decently, but not 
anywhere near the amount of copies that the East Village other was selling. The numbers weren't sexy enough. No, the numbers weren't sexy enough. So Underground Comics came and went in New York in about a year and a half. When the Blimp Works was pulled, that put a chill on any idea of doing comics for distribution in the city of New York. And so it was, it was San Francisco. We all left. <laughs> we all took off. Uh, this is an early example. This is, this is an early example of my work when I, I didn't know what the hell I was doing. Um, I still have this character, Mr. Toad, who, I, who I, I, I think I'm wedded to for life. I really like him. And this is in the early days when he was um, just out of control. He was just a, a raging id. Um, and, um, you know, I, I wonder when the, when the editors of these papers read these what they thought, because I wouldn't have printed this. <laughs> So, you know, I, I even, at the, even at the time, you wouldn't have printed it. I, I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't supporting the counterculture, and I wasn't a hippie really. I was, I, I probably looked a little like a hippie, but. How old were you? How old was I? Uh, twenty-four. Twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five. Yeah. And, um, I mean, I, you know, I, I got stoned, and I did the stuff that you did, but, a lot of the comic artists around me were doing. With the exception, I think, I mean, Robert was really, Crumb was really an exception in every way, of course. I mean, Crumb, Crumb came into this world <laughs> fully blown, fully, fully formed at the age of seven. <laughs> I mean, literally, he was just a genius at, from the beginning. So, uh, he's, he's sui generis, as they say. There's no, nothing, no one else like him. But the other cartoonists, to one degree or another, were, in, were doing their work somewhat in support of the, of, of the counterculture. Kim Deitch had a character called Sunshine Girl. Sunshine Girl was basically tripping on acid. And Kim was using his acid experiences to get storylines, and people reading it got that, and it reinforced their idea that if you take acid, everything is beautiful and all that stuff. <laughs> I, I worked stoned occasionally, but it, not, it never really worked out for me. It didn't, it just produced gibberish. But not, but, but not the right kind of gibberish. Yeah, right. Well, what am I saying? I'm the king of gibberish. Um, <laughs> I control gibberish. Is what I'm I, 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 I definitely use gibberish, but I have a little editor in my head that, that makes it work somehow. You have, you have to have the editor. Okay. And so another East Village off the cover by Spiegelman. Here's, here's Art Spiegelman. I had not met him at this point. When I went down to the offices of the East Village other, I met Kim. And I met uh, Spain, who you may know, Spain Rodriguez. Um, and I met Jay Kinney. Anybody know who he is? <laughs> but I never met Art. I didn't meet Art until we went out to San Francisco. And he, we should have met, but we just didn't bump into each other. Um, Art was also doing stuff that kind of was trippy, <laughs> as, as with this cover. Uh, although Art was not a trippy person, <laughs> um, his work did do some sort of reinforcing of the counterculture, I think, and um, it made sense in that way. Okay. And this is just a typical issue. Ha these happened to be issues that I had lying around. <laughs> um, Screw later did comic covers. In fact, they did many, many comic covers. But this is before they got into comic covers, and the only kind of arty touches that that wacky logo at the top, <laughs> which I, th I remember thinking was really cool. <laughs> Uh, laughing. The contents of Screw were excruciatingly embarrassing to me. <laughs> <laughs> um, I remember when I looked at my, my, my first strip printed in, I just, I folded all the paper behind. I didn't want to see the rest of the paper <laughs> in relation to my comic. Not that I was prudish, it just seemed just like, I don't know, dirty old man stuff. Or <laughs> I mean, you know, it's, um, but within, I would say, two or three weeks of doing my first strip. I was painting at this point. I was living in, on 106th and Broadway. I had a job at a book company on, near Columbus Circle, a French book company. I was packing books. And I painted all day, all night rather. And when I saw my first strip, I asked Steve Heller, how many people are gonna see this? How many copies do you print? And you said 10,000. I said 10,000? I'm lucky if 10 people see my paintings. Forget this, and I, I ditched painting within within six months. <laughs> I was within six months. I went from a starving 
painter to a starving cartoonist. <laughs> <laughs> Let that be a lesson. Yes. Okay, and I think this is the last one here. This is, yeah, this is a couple of years later when I came back to New York for a, a visit. This was the very beginning of graffiti in the subways, hmm. which at the time I didn't, you know, I didn't think I was doing anything historical, but in 1972, 71, 72, Graffiti in the subways was actually just tagging done by gang members, and Turok 161 was the main guy. He was everywhere. And the other ones are all real too, Magic, Inca, Greek, and the numbers below them are the streets, the streets on which they lived. So, I mean, I, you know, I, think I, added, I have Toad doing his tag, and Zippy is keeping an eye out for him, but... Um, <laughs> The New York Ace lasted a couple of years. It was a, it was a much better paper, I think, in many ways than the, than the East Village other, although less culturally important, maybe less of a of a. Uh, you know, it, it came along because papers like the East Village other existed, so it wasn't a trailblazing paper, but it had it had it had a better. D Steve Heller was also the art director. It had a great look and uh, better articles and. It wasn't embarrassing to look at. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't have to fold that one over. Okay, and uh, Bob, if we want to jump over to you now. Uh, Bob, you gave us some uh, other images, some of, some of things that you were in and some things that you just thought were important to talk about in this context. Sure, I, and um, I had the great uh, fortune to work with Art Spiegelman and Francoise Mouly at Raw Books, which was their company, which was essentially them working out of their loft. And I worked with them for many years, and um, it was, it was the premier alternative comic <laughs> uh, on the East Coast, at least. There was Weirdo uh, on the West Coast, but, um, but Raw was the place I wanted to be, and I was very lucky to work with them for a number of years. And Bill, I know you were in the first issues of Raw, too. Yep, yep. And, um, and Raw, was, Raw was a kind of an outgrowth of Arcade, if people know Arcade from the 70s. That was the anthology. Art Spiegelman and I put a magazine together called Arcade for two years, 75 to 76. And um, then Art, after a few years, Art left to go back to New York, and Raw came. <laughs> so it's kind of a genealogy there. Right, right. So this is about 10 years after Arcade, and at this point, uh, the first volume of Mouse had come out, so suddenly that alternative comic book, what is it, suddenly became a bestseller, and that allowed this collection of early, earlier issues of Raw to be published by Pantheon. So, again, the continuum from working in the undergrounds to mainstream uh, outlets continues. Uh, it's just around the same time Zippy started, I guess, actually, right? You said 86 he started in Zippy? Uh, yeah. The, yeah, as a daily. Yeah. As a daily. So, <laughs> 80s, when I, just when I got out of school, comics were suddenly becoming hip again, and people were reading stuff, and all of those articles that you've read, comics aren't just for kids, that was the year they all came out, 1986. <laughs> wow, it all kind of jumps together. Uh, I brought these out just because, again, uh, in the 90s, uh, there were a lot of outlets for uh, comics in these two publications. A lot of my friends, and occasionally, I would contribute strips to these. The New York Press recently passed on, and uh, The Village Voice, which is still going, of course. Um, but they were a home for a lot of people uh, to create work, besides Pfeiffer and Stan Mack, and um, Mark Allen Stamity and a few others, they, the, certainly the voice led in a lot of new people, and the press had an amazing lineup when they started in 1986. I think it was Mark Newgarden, Kaz, Ben Catcher, probably forgetting a few, Mark Beyer, just amazing group of alternative cartoonists finding a home where they could create weekly strips and sort of move closer to the mainstream, somehow. <laughs> and The New Yorker, um, Francoise Mouly, who you may remember from two slides ago, <laughs> became the uh, art director for the covers of The New Yorker in the early 90s, and Robert Crumb is on the cover of The New Yorker, so from the East Village Other to The New Yorker. And again, I suppose, I, and, and the, the cover on, the, on, your, on that side <laughs> is uh, one of mine, which is referencing Peter Arno. Peter Arno his classic character from the 50s meeting a punk from 1995. <laughs> uh, so it's the old New Yorker and the new New Yorker. So another example of alternative cartoonists getting their way in. And Bill, you did a number of great strips for the New Yorker. 
in yes, the when, 90s when as well. Yes, when Tina Brown hijacked The New Yorker for a couple of years, I was proud to do some cartoon or journalism for them, yes. Yeah. So Tina Brown was very forward thinking. And I just, this is a number of different anthologies that I've contributed to. These are um, anthologies edited by cartoonists in New York who also would reach beyond the borders of New York. But a lot of these artists went to school at SVA, were sort of uh, in the soup of all the alternative cartooning scene here, and uh, went on to create their own anthologies, partially inspired by Raw, partially inspired by Weirdo. This is a recent one. Uh, it's an edited by Glenn Head. Um, this is a cover by Michael Copper. I mean, that's a perfect, this cover is a perfect example of alternative That comics. isn't supposed to be Francoise <laughs> in the bottom, is it? No, I don't think so. It looks like <laughs> you should ask Michael. It looks like her. It's a little bit, yeah. I think I had that issue of poo. <laughs> <laughs> it's very valuable. <laughs> Um, oh, and this is a cover I drew for another anthology edited by Danny Hellman, another mainstay, a mainstay of Screw magazine for many years, as well as a, 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 an illustrator of note. And um, there is a real community here. I mean, I came to the city because it, in the 80s, it felt like a media capital. I really wanted to be part of that media scene. And even though a lot of my comics end up parodying more successful corporate characters, I still love that stuff, and I've had a lot of opportunities to work at big organizations. That New Yorker cover I showed you, I didn't think that would be a cover. It was kind of a parody of The New Yorker. It ended up on the cover of The New Yorker. <laughs> that kind of blew my mind. Uh, I, did not, I did not expect that to happen. Um, it was submitted sort of as an interior joke gag, and it became the cover, and that almost made my head blow up. And oh, this last this, yeah, this 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 one kind of moving into the kind of the community aspect of New York. So yes. since, since you seem to be kind of one of those hubs, I, doing I, carousel. I like to be a hub. Yes, um, <laughs> I know a lot of. I've been in New York for over twenty years, and I know a lot of cartoonists. And I love theater. I've done a lot of performance art. Talk about alternative art. <laughs> um, I love performance art, and I love theater. And uh, I began doing these shows where. We do cartoon readings of our work, and I started it when the carousel slide projector was the means by which to project <laughs> artwork. Does anyone remember slides? You've probably seen the episode of Mad Men that explained them to you. <laughs> in any case, I've been doing this show for over 10 years, and I keep trying to pull in more people and, and sort of get, find another audience for people who might not necessarily read alternative comics, but like stories with funny pictures. And Julia's been in my show. And that leads us to Julia. And uh, Julia, you sent me a couple of pictures of you in your studio, and you're not alone in your studio in these. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about kind of like the, the community that you feel yourself a part of now. Also, in drinking at the movies, there's a lot of scenes of you sitting uh, at diners or whatever with your other cartoonist friends and stuff like that. If you could just maybe talk about the kind of the, car the, the community that you kind of feel that you're a part of right now. Sure. Uh, so I used to share a studio with us. Uh, five other female cartoonists. Um, it wasn't on purpose that we were all female, but just it happened. We were just all friends. Uh, this is a bunch of other cartoonists who Stephanie has visited, um, who are just, you may even be in that picture, Stephanie. Um, they're just, this is the, our studio, and we just have cartoonists over. We used to draw together all um, once a week we would get together. So it's kind of like there's this community of cartoonists in Brooklyn that, um, really is unrivaled. I think Portland has a hub of a lot of cartoonists, but um, there's just a lot in Brooklyn, specifically in, uh, there's a lot of us in Greenpoint. So, I mean, I guess that's what the community looks like for New York. Um, I don't, yeah, there's, I did, obviously I did not understand the assignment, so I just sent out the pictures. <laughs> <of> <laughs> I'm just like, look how fabulous it is. I have so many friends. <laughs> So there's the work thing again, I guess. You know what's interesting, though, is uh, these guys have been showing slides of all the old um, anthologies and newspapers, and people think that those aren't really around anymore, which isn't true. Um, there's Smoke Signals is one that Gabe Fowler from Desert Island puts together that's absolutely great. I think we've all um, worked mm -hmm. with him about that. But he puts together, and it's very much like the old ones. It's like, a, it's like an old fold-out newspaper, and it just has like really weird comics to fairly normal comics. That would definitely be alternative if you want to 
use that word, and a lot of cartoonists now put together mini comics with a lot of other people's work in it. So it definitely still happens, it's just sort of on a different level, and I think there's actually, it, there's a resurgence of it, because there's a backlash against, um, I don't really know the word for, not, for like, against big publishing, because it was, they tried to, to get a bunch of indie cartoonists a couple of years ago, and it didn't work out, and there was a backlash against it, where the cartoonists were like, you know, like, I don't want to work with big publishers because they didn't have my back, and now I'm going back to small press and doing stuff like that, like old magazines. So it's kind of like, you know, it started with really alternative, and then it, it did a huge arc, and we went to the other side, and it was awful, so everyone's coming back <laughs> to, the, to the smaller circle where I think comics feel like belong right now since it is such a you know, a harder medium for people to wrap their minds around right now. But I, I remember my mom got an issue of, um, I think it was just that Sunday magazine in The New Yorker, and there was, they had put a, a Chris Ware, like, four-page spread, and they were starting a new thing. They were like, this, you know, comics, this is new, let's put it in, see how the, the general public likes them. And my mom called me, and she was like, Julia, I saw it, I saw a cartoon. It was four pages long, and it was in The New York Times. <laughs> and she was so excited, like, she had just never seen one before. And then she was like, it's your friend, right? And like, I'm not friends. I wish I was friends with Chris Ware. Like, no, we're not all friends. It's not that small. But, um, so, you know, it's kind of, it's going out there, but I think we're kind of reclaiming it in a sense. Okay. So. Thanks. And uh, we're going to have to go through these, uh, unfortunately, the, the individual strips pretty quickly because I still want to have time for Charles to talk also. But Bill gave us a, a few stories, a, a few zippy strips that are mm -hmm. kind of in New York. And this well, is one that you, you've already yeah. told this story. Well, this, I, I already told you the story. So this is just my strip about <laughs> getting my first uh, work published for Steve Heller and Screw and him saying the right proportions. I use New York a lot in my strips. I like, I like to do architecture. I like... I like old photos um, in the bottom zippies in the, under the 3rd Avenue L. Um, the top, I don't know if anybody knows who Crazy Guggenheim is. <laughs> That's a reference to a character in an old Jackie Gleason TV show. Um, but I, yeah, I, I, uh, San Francisco and New York are my favorite cities. And right now, New York above San Francisco. I lived in San Francisco 28 years, and I think I did it. Um, it's a great city, but um, New York is where I'm from. And I always come back to it for material. And this bottom strip is just a great example of what I always tell people, that uh, Zippy has more art per square inch than anything else in the newspaper. <laughs> it's just phenomenal. At the top is Brooklyn. Zippy goes time traveling to Brooklyn in 1926, but he's humming a song from 1966. <laughs> so go figure. Um, and he encounters Bob Big Boy, Bob's Big Boy. Those are all from photographs of Old Park Slope. And the bottom is the, um, can you read what station it is? I think it's the Coney Island stop. Chauncey Street? Uh, no, Chauncey, Chauncey Street. Street yep. Chauncey Street was another, another reference to the, um, an old TV show, but here's Zippy meeting the spirit body of Alice Cramden. <laughs> um, and this one, I don't know, just a lot of times my the locations come to, be, come to me in very dreamlike ways. And I had this kind of dream of that I was walking through Times Square. I did this um, while I was still in San Francisco, I think. So why, I don't know why Times Square, but I like to place, place either Zippy or my Griffey character in a location that I just like to draw and then have the stuff happen that's gonna happen. It doesn't <laughs> what, always relate to the backgrounds. What kind of reference do you use? Um, well, usually photographs. Postcards. I have a huge collection of old postcards and um, books, books of New York photos. Um, now I use Google a lot. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I, I use reference and then I play with it and toy with it and hope it comes out. Okay. This is a Sunday strip. So. Okay. Bob? This was, a, this was actually a, a strip that was commissioned by a big major metropolitan magazine and got killed. And then it appeared in an alternative, week, uh, alternative anthology. And this is just, um, this is an interesting example of my work, I guess, because it's sort of different than what I usually do. These are anecdotes about my life that actually happened filtered through different newspaper comics, which is what I always play with. I don't usually use myself as subject matter, but in the spirit of a, um, a panel about New York, I, th I thought I should bring in, especially the one in the Kathy parody in the top where 
uh, someone's masturbating on the subway. So that seemed like, <laughs> seemed like a New York thing to bring up. <laughs> Sorry, everybody <laughs> at Columbia. Uh, this is a um, this is a recent this is a recent piece, not about New York, but just a strip I'm working on now. I my shtick, the shtick on which I based my life, is uh, I I adapt uh, the classics of Western literature in the style of famous cartoons. Hopefully still famous in the 21st century. This is uh, Homer's Popeye. And um, yeah, this is sort of a six page, a six panel teaser for what will probably be a very long story ultimately. The classicist will appreciate I am nobody in panel two. I just love that. <laughs> oh. Uh, and this. This is a. Uh, this was done for a law magazine. This is me trying to find a way to like take what I'm interested in and put it into, um, you know, into a more mainstream publication. So this is me adapting a very New York story, Twelve Angry Men, in this, you know, using uh, superheroes mostly based in New York. So, so there you go. Um, and I guess I apologize to the to the U.S. judicial system for this. One. <laughs> okay, now we got a couple of pages from Julia. And I, cho I just chose a couple of them where you're kind of like having uh, kind of uh, New York moments, like several New York moments per page. Yeah, this is a day out on the town. Um, I, I haven't looked at this in a while. I don't know what's happening. Oh, I don't know. Some lady was shoplifting bought, like bags and nuts in one of those panels, and everyone was screaming Code 99, and she just like plowed me over, and then I couldn't stop laughing, and they were like, what's wrong with you? <laughs> I don't even know what's going on. I don't know what I'm looking at. Well, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I'm like walking through the Lower East Side and they're shooting movies all the time, and I, um, actually, I had my headphones on. This is a very like, you know, my generation thing. I had my headphones on. I wasn't paying attention, and I walked right onto the movie set, and I didn't realize they were all like yelling at me to not be where I was, to move my body, and I was like, "What's happening?" <laughs> Here's some songs in my head. <laughs> Oh yeah, when I first moved to New York, uh, one of the things that I got from another cartoonist, a job was work doing set building for really fancy rich people. So that's <laughs> us doing set building for a Sean Combs perfume release party. It was, it was so ridiculous. As you do. Yeah, you know, just on a Tuesday. <laughs> I had, that's just what it's sort of like to, to work, I guess, in the middle of Manhattan. I saw they're shooting sex in the city, and I was just kind of sitting right there, hoping I was in the background, so I was making a really weird face. <laughs> so I was like, this will be awesome if this is on TV. And I didn't notice that, but you're right. Sarah, Sarah Jessica Parker does kind of look like a foot. Oh, I hate that line because I stole it from Family Guy, and I don't actually like that show, and I think that's a really mean thing to say. So, so I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, now let's go, I want to turn it over to Charles a little bit, and Charles is going to talk a little bit about again, kind of the, the the repercussions of creating alternative work. Right. I think that one of the um, one of the things that puts alternative and put underground comics on the radar is that they confront the established boundaries of what's understood to be acceptable culture and. The underground comics of the late 1960s uh, were, you know, a, a real revolution in that. And the mo the epicenter of that revolution, arguably, was Zap Comics, which was founded by Robert Crumb and went on to include contributions from Spain and S. Clay Wilson and Victor Moscoso uh, and uh, and others. And uh, they were always a bit of a target for. Uh, for interest from the authorities. And so, again, the impulse of the alternative cartoonist, the underground cartoonist, is to speak in contrast to the flow of how the world is going. And so, Zap doing that, Zap being very confrontational and frank about sexuality, about drug use, about the hypocrisy of the culture, was one of those books that received a lot of attention and a lot of intimidation where police would go into stores and say, you better not be selling that on my beat. And so as Bill mentioned, there was a period of time where the undergrounds were frequently getting busted, where the sh shopkeepers either at the head shops uh, or the um, alternative bookstores 
uh, would be targeted. And so on the West Coast, you saw a lot of activity where the iconic bookstore in Berkeley, Moe's, uh, was intimidated by police for selling copies of Snatch and copies of Zap. Uh, the Berkeley Phoenix Art Gallery was busted for the display of obscene material for a show of underground comics work. And there was even an arrest for Zap number two in Encino, California. So it, the artists were informed by all of this. They were looking at the fact that people were getting arrested, uh, people were getting intimidated, and you know they basically went, well, fuck it, let's really push the borders. Let's figure out uh, you know, where we can take it. And so Zap number four was deliberately designed to be as provocative as possible. And, um, and it's a great issue. And it, it contains uh, probably the most controversial story, the one that was brought up most um, in references during the arrest, uh, Robert Crumb's story, Joe Blow, which you see a page from here. Joe I, chose, Blow, I chose the calmest page. I'm sorry? I chose the calmest, most uh, tranquil page. They're all show. tranquil pages. We're all adults. It's only art. <laughs> um, but, but Joe Blow um, is a parody, is a, is a satire of the gray flannel suit American family. And it's, it's pointing out the hypocrisies of the homogenous suburban culture that was you know, hey, everybody, go and hang out with your family and do stuff, you know, that was in the environment. Uh, but Crumb, of course, took it to this extreme where he was showing that here's this outside facade. Look how happy they all are. Look at this great house they all live in. And then behind closed doors, they're having an incest orgy. And the, this really raised the hackles of <laughs> censors. <laughs> Because they weren't looking at the artistic merit. They were looking at, well, all of this stuff is for kids. Comic books are for kids. And they're putting dirty pictures in this thing for kids. You know, and this is alongside S. Clay Wilson's pirate rape orgies and Victor, Victor Moscoso's um, psychedelic um, explorations and you know, Spain's revolutionary uh, trash man comics. And so just in one package, you know, they really put a, a live wire on the exposed nerve of you know what was a culture war at the time. And this led to Zap number four being immediately targeted by police in the West and in the East. And in the East is where the charges stuck. And so here in New York, of all places, was really the first time that you saw a conviction for creating obscene comic books. And uh, it would have been in 1970 that the book dealers Peter Dargis, who managed the Eastside Bookshop, and Charles Kirkpatrick, who was the co-manager of the New Yorker Bookshop, were arrested for selling this comic book and were charged with the distribution of obscene material. They were defended by an attorney uh, named Robert Levine, who litigated, I think, a very persuasive defense. He had Gil Kane, who was the cartoonist that contributed to a lot of classic uh, Marvel and DC Comics of the era. Uh, Robert M. Dory, who was the curator of the Whitney Museum of Art. Uh, Stephen Marcus, who was actually a professor here at Columbia and worked in youth education. And Sib Jacobson, who was the publisher of Harvey Comics. And they went on the stand to discuss and describe the redeeming artistic merit in this work and to describe that what Crumb was doing, which is where people were fixated, possessed important artistic and cultural value. But they were seated, they were, they were being heard by a judge named Joel Tyler, who was a moral crusader who later went on to view and subsequently ban the movie Deep Throat uh, in, in the mid 70s. So he was extremely dismissive of the expert testimony, you know, saying to the Columbia professor, you just can't get past the fact that you're a professor, can you? When he's describing in, <laughs> academic terms, the merit of these comics. When Jacobson was on the stand and was talking about the fact that comics do address sexuality and used Archie as an example, uh, the judge was completely shocked. Are you saying Archie is obscene? <laughs> no, Archie is designed to discuss and, and stir uh, sexual impulses in adolescence because this is what they're feeling anyway. You know, you can read this in the transcript. Um, he was describing the work that he was publishing at Harvey as, you know, designed for the youngest of readers. And the judge goes, I take exception to that. I read your comic books all the time. <laughs> so this is the guy that's deciding the fate of underground comic books. And 
easily as you can predict from you know that kind of taste and that kind of dismissiveness of the expert testimony he convicted and uh, so an appeal was waged and there were amicus briefs or friend of the court documents submitted by the Association of American Publishers and the New York Civil Liberties Union espousing the First Amendment merit of the case and the only real leg they had to overturn it was a provision in New York law at the time that said that to be convicted of distributing or promoting obscene material you needed to be you had to do it knowingly and so there was an argument that it would be impossible for the clerk to knowingly possess you know awareness of everything in the shop and ultimately where it came down is well if you displayed it you should have known and as the defendant said afterwards after the conviction was upheld in a four to three um, verdict that this means that you've got to make us chicken about work you've got to make us censor the stuff that comes into the store and so that in, con in concert with the 1973 decision in the Miller test were effectively the, um, the twin punches that knocked out the underground comics economy where the undergrounds were being traded in this national network of head shops and uh, sophisticated bookstores and um, when it became a, a local issue that your local community can determine what's obscene um, there was a general sense that I'm told from people that were there of, well, geez, you know, if a New York, if, if they busted a comic in New York and got a conviction, what chance do I have in Sheboygan, you know, in a shop selling bongs that they're already looking askance at? And so, as Dennis Kitchen told me, there was a period where Tyler Lancey, his sales manager, was charting 1973 sales, and 72, the trend was like this, 73, down, 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 and he actually took the Sharpie, or whatever it was at the time, and took it off the wall and started drawing off of the paper and onto the wall, it, it was plummeting to the floor. And it almost killed the thing. And yet, as this panel is evidence, um, Art thrives and survives, and art continues to provoke, and art continues to push at the limits. And you saw that here in the New York again, with the raw moment that was pr was challenging the notion of um, you know comics as low culture, and also World War III Illustrated, which was taking up the mantle of the punk sensibility and espousing it in very confrontational terms at a time that we needed it. You know, during the Reagan era, where you know, there was a lot of speech, you know, that was like the plasmatics, you know, here in New York, um, you know, making very um, pointed political art. And today, just by way of, you know, conclusion, um, we're seeing another moment where, you know, I think we're, we're at the cusp of a clampdown on corporates going after people like Bob, sorry, Bob, um, <laughs> that are using um, corporately controlled work as commentary, you know, and you're starting to see this notion that's emerging in the halls <clears throat> of Disney and Warner Brothers, but the people at Marvel and DC don't want to, ex don't want to attack, but you're seeing this notion emerging that any use of a drawing that is a trademark character that is not authorized is an infringement. And so, you know, I'm starting to see more artists come to me at the Comic Book Legal Defense Fund, which is an organization that protects the First Amendment rights of comics, and say, I just got this odious cease and desist letter that's saying that I need to turn over all of my original art and, you know, everything that I've ever sold and all the money I've ever made and any children I ever, you know, <laughs> beget because I drew a strip that juxtaposes, um, Tubby and, you know, uh, Jarvis, you know, or whatever the case might be. Um, so, you know, it's never authorized to make an, a, a reproduction, you know, of somebody else's work. But now, you know, what's been established as, you know, understood since, you know, Andy Warhol, that you can make a one-of-a-kind um, artistic piece or you can make a comment using um, corporate marks, that is now, you know, something that's being challenged and I think that's, you know, going to be litigated in the near future. So the job of the underground and the alternative cartoonist is to always speak truth to power and speak to the boundaries of, um, of society and, and, and they do it not for a lot of money, which is why communities like New York are so important because the bonhomie that emerges when you're working with like-minded people advances the art and creates its own kind of reward structure for doing it. Um, and there's always going to be moments where we're living high on the hog and we're getting big advances from publishers. 
Uh, and then there's gonna be moments where they drop us like a lead potato and decide they don't want our work. And it's the communities here that hold up each other's work that advance the art form and it's communities that support people that, you know, that support the work of the Comic Book Legal Defense Fund organizations like this that make sure that the law can't stamp us down permanently. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> We got time for a couple of questions. If anybody wants to step up to the mic over here, it's not a class. Um, so there's been uh, some. T oh, what am I waiting? Okay, all right, great. Uh, so you guys have kind of been talking about uh, there was some mention of sort of how the age of these anthologies have sort of passed, and there's some mentions on the internet. So I've been kind of thinking, wondering. Um, with the internet, we sort of have this new avenue to have a lot uh, like smaller works, independent artists putting their work out there. Do you think that that has sort of opened up an avenue for the continuation of alternative comics and underground comics, or has it sort of diluted their commentary power and their texture? Like, how does it kind of affect uh, alternative comics? I think it's given people more outlets, but I don't think it's squelched anything. Um, I, I, if, if I understand your question, uh, it, it sounds as if uh, it, it's, just a, it's just the latest uh, outlet for people. I don't think it actually has hurt anything except maybe our ability to get paid. But um, I'm, I'm excited about online publishing. I could probably answer this one since I'm of that generation. I, I don't think, like, you know, I don't think it squelches, but I also don't think it really raises anything because anyone can put something online. But if you put something online, say like this is the, the achievement, you know, you can put something online, but you, if your work isn't good, you're not gonna go any higher. No one else is gonna really see it. Your work has to be good enough to excel beyond just putting your shit on the internet. Like you, you know, and if the work isn't there, then it's, that's just gonna stay on the internet. So I don't really think that it expands or retracts or really affects um, anything of the whole. I'm sorry, you got a follow up? Yeah, so I guess, um, like part of the question I should've, Um, I guess um, one of the elements, I guess, re referring to kind of the squelching is more of the community aspect. I mean, he referred to the fact that a lot of the strength of comics today, of like these underground comics today, is in there, the ability for the community to kind of uphold other artists and that sort of thing. And I feel like that's how it was uh, with the older anthologies. You, you know, you guys reference other artists that you worked really closely with. Um, so do you feel like the, I mean, I guess the internet makes each artist more independent. Do you think online communities are uh, not as potent, uh, like support structures um, for, you know, uh, get, like supporting that, the art? That, that's actually variable because here in New York you had the Activate Collective that happened in the um, early 2000s through the mid 2000s, um, you know, that was explicitly about the creation of work to be distributed online and it functioned as a you know a fully fledged anthology and you know now they, there was all of the usual infighting that you get from groups of artists and it dissolved and now there's a new group doing it so i think that you know the community impulse to publish is as strong anywhere and you know i think that as julia said it's neither additive nor subtractive mm -hmm. artists are going to do work and they're going to get it out there as best they can afford okay, okay. next question this is mostly in Charles's wheelhouse, but kind of speaks to everybody. Um, I thought maybe you'd discuss SOPA a little bit. I don't really have anything to say about SOPA, and honestly. How, uh, like how it affects it's what bad. we feel. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, is there, are there communities you're aware of or things that we're doing as a community of artists that are engaging that well, and talking about why we need to be I careful think, with SOPA? I think that you know EFF did a good job managing it, and I think that um, you know the way all of these laws work is that they didn't get passed this time, and they're going to try to pass it you know together next time. And um, you know that's not really our wheelhouse. You know we protect uh, the First Amendment as it affects uh, artists, but I think it's just a matter of using um, art as civic engagement and you know communicating that. Uh, Bob, you can probably take this more. It's bad. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I don't have anything to add to it. I'm sorry. I, just, I was just being smarmy or snarky. Okay, one last question. Uh, 
What I'm really burning to know, and Julia touched on it a little bit, um, is what did or what do your moms think about what you do? <laughs> My mother had a zippy tattoo on the back. <laughs> My mom was always very supportive of my work, but if you can appear in the New Yorker, that kind of raises the, that raises the um, level of appreciation. That's all I have to say. My mom's actually, um, we, I grew up reading your comic, and my mom was the first one who showed it to me too, so she's probably a bigger fan of you than she's of me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and my mom likes it. She's always like, I'm so funny, put me in a comic, I'm so clever. <laughs> That's cool. Well, support, supportive is a good way to end the panel. If we could just thank our panelists once again.